Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Randy Harper's back. We've missed her. We're going to talk about X2Go, which is a remote desktop solution that's like BNC, but has a lot more features. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Randy Harper. Episode 295, recorded May 21st, 2014. X to go. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free Libre open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects that you might be using every day, the little projects you might be using every day and not aware of it. Are, and that doesn't make any sense. I, I do this so many times and I, I don't know, it's not scripted. It's really obviously not scripted. Anyway, we're going to have a great show today. But first, let me bring on my co host. Welcome back to the show, FreeBSD Girl, also known as Randy Harper. Welcome back. Thanks. Oh my gosh, it's been a, quite a while. I'm so glad to be back. Indeed, indeed, and I'm glad it worked out for you to be able to do that. Now, you're coming to us from a new location. Where are you at now? I have moved back to the Bay Area. So right now I am in Oakland, um, heading to San Francisco right after I get done here to go start my new job, which I just got into three weeks ago. Awesome, awesome. And I'm in a slightly different room, if people are noticing. I'm a super recruiter who normally provides me that wonderful tree in the background room. Uh, they are doing a conference there today. So I, they kicked me back to this small, tiny little office space. And there's a whole bunch of people just outside the window here talking and uh, selling stuff for ZipRecruiter. So uh, if you hear a kind of little leaky noise every once in a while, that's probably what that is. Just ignore it. It's not where the show is. The show is, the show is here. The show is actually happening here, happening live. And uh, so let's talk about what the project is today. It's X2Go. And I've been trying to read through the documentation, trying to figure out mostly what it is. I've been describing it as VNC sort of on steroids, but VNC also in a way that uses minimal bandwidth so that you can actually use it over uh, you know, mobile communication lines, things like that. But I'm also noticing it has like remote execution and things, which I don't think VNC can do. So, uh, Randy, what do you know about this? Um, pretty much what you just said. Um, I actually talked to a couple people at work about it because I was wondering, you know, trying to get information from people and see if they had questions. And I think it has to do, well, I know it has to do with like remote desktop viewing and I know some people are using it as an alternative to VNC. So I'm really interested in hearing what these guys have to say. Cool, cool. Well, uh, you know, instead of us kind of uh, hypothesizing about what it is, let's <laughs> go ahead and bring on our guests because they're going to be a lot easier to talk to about that. But we'll all know a lot more. Let's put it that way. So let's go ahead and bring on, where's my notes? Where's my notes? Mike Gabriel, welcome to the show. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. And uh, where, where are you speaking to us from? Uh, I'm sitting at Kiel University in Germany right now, actually. Very cool. Well, you sound really clear, so that's good. Uh, thanks to the internets and interwebs to get you over here, so that was good. But let's also go ahead and bring on the other Mike. This is going to be a complicated show. Mike DiPaolo, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And where are you speaking to us from? I'm from the, my home in the Philadelphia suburbs. Okay, cool. Well, that's a, so a little bit closer uh, to, to the other two of us and also to uh, where we're head editing the show from. So uh, let, so I gave, of course, that really brief overview of X2Go. Uh, Mike 1, uh, you know, we have permission to call you Mike 1 and Mike 2, I've been told. So Mike <laughs> 1, would you go ahead and sort of give us you know, the 30,000 foot view? What is X2Go and what problem does it solve? Okay. Um, X2Go is a remote desktop solution. So remote desktop solution can be really desktop shells like... Marty, KDE, GNOME, whatever, uh, and running on a remote server and getting it over the WAN to your local machine. And um, you mentioned the word VNC at the beginning, at the in, during the introduction, and it's there is a bit of VNC technology in Xgo, but it's actually more X11 than than VNC. So and, elaborate on that, please. Yeah. Yes. And um, so, so apart from uh, getting a desktop shell from one machine to the other, maybe full screen or in a window, um, you can also have published applications that you see on the local machine, on your client, on your rex to go client, and the remote application runs on the terminal server, on the remote server. Um, and published applications means in this context that the applications... Um, you get a list of applications. You get actually a start menu, an application menu like you use from your local uh, desktop shell um, that tells you what is available on the remote server and whatnot. 
and these windows then seamlessly integrate into your um, into your local desktop shell. Wow, that sounds pretty cool. And how did this how did this start? How long has it been around? Um, so actually, um, like I think it was two thousand. Um, I joined the project in two thousand ten. So I'm I'm, I'm, hmm. I'm lacking five years of history of the project. But um, it was it started in two thousand five when um, there was a use case, two use cases actually, at a municipality in Germany and at a school near that municipality, where um, um, where, where people needed a replacement for 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 sun rays. Not sure mm -hmm. if you know what these are. It's think line environment, um, and you work on 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 uh, Solaris workstations, and um, so they need a replacement for that, uh, a free one, a cheap one, or well, free software is not only not uh, always cheap, but a a a, uh, a solution that could be implemented for free. Um, and then two guys uh, in southern Germany, Heinz Markus Grazing and Alexander Schneider, um, they they. Well, wrote a prototype, just a proof of concept. Hey, this is possible with X11 and it's possible with Linux. And um, they, they wrote a thin client environment that would serve um, as a classroom uh, in, in that school and later in the municipality as well. Later on, um, it, that was all X11. So, so you can do that on the local area network, but if you well, if you have a DSL, a DSL connection or even a um, GPRS or whatever edge um, on, on mobile networks, then, then it doesn't really work. I mean, you know SSH minus X is very, very slow because of all the round trips in X11. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the uh, founders of the project at that time um, took a look at a product called NX by the company named No Machine. And they, No Machine has a lot of tools to offer and one tool is the NX X11 implementation which added um, compression technologies, round trips, uh, got rid of round trips in the X11 protocol and added caching of bitmaps to X11. And um, so the core of the No Machine product is the NX X11 server that allows you to to get applications from a X11 applications from a remote machine over a very uh, low bandwidth connection um, to 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 your local machine. So, and this only this bit of the no machine technology then was taken and was implanted in what already existed in X to go, which is session management, um, user management, um, a database that handles all that stuff, etc. Cool, cool. And what brought you to the project? You said you joined in 2010. Yes, um, in 2010. Um, well, I, I, I use this, this um, NX product from No Machine quite a lot. And mm -hmm. um, the, there was a um, commercial implementation, which was two users per server, which is not really much for a terminal server, is it? Um, mm -hmm. And there was also, a, a, well, actually two free, free projects that were imitating what NX was doing between client and server, this, this communication protocol, the session setup. And uh, these implementations were free. It was free NX and Need NeedX, um, which was developed by Google, I think. Mm. Um, and both projects got stalled at that time. So um, newer Ubuntu or Debian or whatever Linux distributions were not supported um, that well anymore. Because, well, then the new desktop shell uh, in, in Ubuntu did not work anymore and whatever. So I looked for something else and I stumbled over x to go and I really liked it because it just worked. Um, mm. But it has it had kinks, you know. It had bits and pieces which which did not really make sense. One thing that has not been solved yet is you have you had one client, one program to connect to to remote um, to remote sessions, and this um, client is a huge window because it's designed for thin client environments, and it's the usability is great, but uh, you can just launch one session. So if you, like me at that time being a system administrator, if you work on like three, seven, eight, nine, ten, whatever uh, the number is of servers, then you have loads of x go client main windows, which take quite a bit of space on your screen. And then you, you have the session windows or, or a remote shell with, um, with X11 support so that you could run other graphical applications from that. Um, and um, and I said, wow, this is, I mean, 
it works, but it's not really for my use for my use case. It's not really usable because I had all these client windows and loads of applications running in the taskbar, and and then I thought, well, okay, uh, couldn't there be a command line client that was just I mean one line on the shell, and uh, I get a window on a remote machine. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I looked at the code. Um, there was a Perl reference implementation, which was very old at that time already. So it was good for learning, but not learning the protocol, learning the session handshake. Um, and then by coincidence, I stumbled over a piece of code written in Python that implemented um, a, 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 an x go session startup. Mm. And um, that with this piece of code, there was a little problem because it was taken away, it was, it was removed from the web, and it should, originally was LGPL license, and then the license had been retaken because of, I don't want to indulge into that. But it's, um, so, so I, I, ha I had seen the code, and I needed to rewrite that because it was good. It, so the concept of how the x to go session was started in this, in this Python code was really brilliant. Um, and then I just sat down. I remember it was in Berlin on, um, taking a class in, in, in osteopathy there. Um, and um, I was sitting there at the night and hacking together this Python code. And after a week, I could start my first session. And, and this changed into a GUI implementation of X2Go that just docks to your, to your system tray. And, um, and like the network manager applet you may know, um, you, you have one menu left click, another menu right click, and from these two menus you just coordinate endless numbers of sessions on remote machines. Wow, that was a fascinating answer. But uh, you know, we're almost out of time. So sorry, Mike, too, that we didn't get to you at all. But <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful answer. No, uh, Mike, too, I, I want to give Mike one a chance to take a, a breather for a second or two. Um, how, uh, how did uh, you get involved with the project? Okay, so, I mean, using Windows, I always thought that remote desktop connection was the coolest feature of Windows. And like five years ago or so, when I started switching, using Linux a lot more, I, thought that I found that no machine in X3 was the closest thing possible, and I liked it. However, the problem was that it had, there was on, the, the free implementations of it, like FreeNX were unmaintained, and they had compatibility issues with Ubuntu 12.04. So at work, I recently, we had a requirement imposed on us by, the, by corporate saying, it's a very common sense requirement. All passwords in transit over the company intranet must be encrypted. However, we had been using a basic X11 with XDMCP. And although it was very easy to set up, all the keyboard input, including the initial username and password, was since unencrypted over the, over the intranet. So hmm. I looked for, so in my case, I had plenty of bandwidth. I had a you know, high bandwidth gigabits or 100 megabit LAN at work, but I needed some, you know, easy way to do remote desktop, and I found that X2Go was, you know, the, the solution that just worked. It worked the best in providing, you know, the, you know the, the full desktop environment, although some of my users like launching individual applications, and they can do that too. And at work, we were basically required to use Windows on our desktop, so I was always using the X2Go Windows client, and I've, so ever since I had a need for it, I've been main, maintaining and contributing to the Windows client however I can. A lot of what I'm doing is involves uh, working with the upstream projects like Pulse Audio and Visual C X Server. What's it like working uh, on a Windows project when I, I'm guessing most of the source originated in the Unix world? Right. I mean, I use Sigwin a lot, and that's mm. a huge help. I mean, I also, you know, and when I'm doing general Linux development, I, I, you know, I do all my Linux development on a Linux server or a Linux desktop, and then I just actually go into it. I have all the development tools accessible from Windows Desktop that way, you know. Cool. And um, how are, is this just uh, a labor of love for you? Or are you just doing it on your spare time because you need the results of this, or, or, um, or do you have uh, higher goals for all this? I mean, for now, it's just I, it's what I enjoy doing with my free time. I mean, I always I found I find remote desktop solutions to be cool, so that's why I'm spending uh, like half or so of my free time on it. Cool. Cool. So um, I have a couple questions, actually. And one is you mentioned Sigwin. And this is like a weird hacking question, but I do weird things with my computers, so I have to know. <laughs> um, so there are X11 solutions for Windows. And you talked a little bit about Sigwin. Is it possible to run the server on Windows in Sigwin using Windows X11? 
it, yes, it, you, you, uh, so, uh, no, the server, the X2Go server cannot be run on Windows. If it were ported to Sigwin, all it could do would share it, it'd be share at X2Win Windows and not the entire Windows desktop. But in terms of the X2Go client, you can have it use the Sigwin X server. Uh, by default, we bundle the Visual C X server, VC X S R V. Um, okay. And the, the way the way X2Go is designed is basically there's the there's the uh, NX X server running on the X2Go server, and then there's an X server running on the X2Go client. And then X2Go proxy sits between them, compressing and caching all the all X11 traffic. So if the server is running its own X11 server, you don't actually have to be running like X11, like another server on the host for it to be working? Correct. You, you just need the, X, the NX server. It basically runs as the user account. It doesn't need root or anything. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. It runs mm -hmm. under the SSH session, and, it can, and, and the session can be made running even after you disconnect from SSH. Okay, so that was kind of a question I had. So normally, um, if you're doing like X11 forwarding and things like that, and you're actually connecting to like a remote X11 host, when you disconnect, you kind of lose those applications. Like they're gone, they're yeah. shutting down because they're, yeah. they're running that way. So is there a way to send these applications to background so you can reconnect to them? I mean, will they keep running in background? How does that, how does that work? Yeah, that is the default behavior. If you just click the X on the x to go client window rather than doing a full logout, they stay running. Um, Mike, number one, can you provide the details about this? Yes, sure, I can. No problem. Um, uh, so, so what what you start on the server machine for your se session is an X server, but it's not X org. It's an X agent, or we call it X to go agent. We've branded it a little bit, and this X server is a process on the server machine that under that supports um, connects and disconnects, or resuming and suspending. So resume. Uh, so, oh, you start a session. This X server starts up. In this X server, you have applications, a complete desktop shell, whatever, and and if you um, and and the 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 pendant on the um, on the client side is the NX proxy, and this NX proxy is just taking all the NX data from the from the X server from the X to go session window, and displaying it on the local client side X server. So it's a lot local and remote and server and client, I know, but it's the concept of it. Um, and, um, and whenever you disconnect NX proxy from X2Go agent, and NX proxy is a component inside X2Go client, it's, we, we, we wrap around it and start it uh, when the session comes up. If you just disconnect, then the session on the server stays alive and all the processes in the session also stay alive, um, which which also means it's like it's like you know this um, or oh, I, I cannot pronounce it actually I can only write it uh, this screen tool like new screen um, it's it's the same concept but for a graphical desktop so so it it stays on the server it stays alive applications in the Exago session stay alive do certain tasks like building some code or whatever and um, and when Whenever you want to come back to the session, you resume the session using x to go client and you continue at the place where the session now is. Not where you've left it, but where it now is. So if some script has been running there, it, it has kept running. And, um, and uh, a new feature of the 401, 4100 version of x to go server is a uh, renicing of those applications running in suspended sessions so, so that you take away the load from the server uh, if a session is is in suspended state. Oh, cool. So, yeah. so what is like, uh, what do the resources on the server look like if it's just running, sitting there running with, you know, no applications running in the X2Go session? Yeah. I mean, does it take so, up that much? Yeah, so so um, I have a school where where one terminal server is running, and it serves one classroom for about uh, twenty students, and then there are loads of machines uh, spread out all over the school in in um, uh, areas where people just do some research in the library or whatever. And there, I think it's another twelve to twenty clients. This machine is an eight core machine um, and having thirty two gigabyte RAM. And they don't, well, they, with some applications, they realize they're on a terminal server, but with most normal applications like Office, like web browser, if you don't do Flash inside the web browser, then you won't realize. 
So uh, what's the installation process look like for the server? Oh, that's pretty simple. Um, we, uh, it depends, actually depends on what distribution you are and what, what architecture. But for AMD64 and for i386, for Intel-based um, uh, architectures, we, we have packages and we have packages for Debian, we have packages for Ubuntu. We, um, since Christmas this year, um, um, a German company has sponsored um, um, the project to provide RPM packages for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And while doing those, we also did um, upstream packages for Fedora. Um, and you simply do on Debian, you just say aptitude install x to go server. And if you want to serve full desktop sessions, you are recommended to install the package x to go server x session as well from our packaging archive. So you and mentioned then, 64. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah. Yeah, no, no problem. Go ahead. Uh, what I was done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, what I was going to ask though um, was architecture support. So you mentioned like 64 bit, but do you have things like ARM support? Um, we have. Well, the, the 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 issue about ARM support is that you need hardware to build stuff on. Our build environment is based on QEMU, so we can build packages for any architecture that's asked for. Um, we have uh, have um, configured the build environment for ARM packages, but um, a package build takes uh, of of a normal Qt application like Exago client takes a couple of hours there. So it's like three to four hours, and then or maybe two to three. And um, so we don't do that often, and normally do on, only do it for releases. Um, but since well, in 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 December, we have set up this new build environment together with this RPM contract we, we got from this German company. And uh, actually, this is something that I should put onto my to-do list to have release builds for uh, ARM32 architectures. So I thought I'd point out one thing. Uh, if mm -hmm. you're using Vaspian, the most popular Raspberry Pi uh, Linux distro, that includes x 2 clients in it. It's a little bit older version, but it's, it works well. So as far as like getting, you know, support for ARM and being able to do that more reliably, um, is it a matter of resources? Like, are you looking for people to volunteer hardware or time? <laughs> time, yeah. <laughs> not, not, not in terms of architectures, but um, in terms of, um, well, well X2Go has, has one, one major challenge. Uh, we have several desktop shells on the free software market, which is like Mata, LXDE, XFCE, which work well. But then there is uh, GNOME 3, Unity, which, well, you can try that out and uh, help us fixing problems if you encounter any. Then you have KDE, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we have to adapt to all these different kinds of desktop shells. And then these desktop shells exist on different distributions, like Fedora, Ubuntu, et cetera, uh, Debian. And then there are different versions of these distributions and all these different desktop shells behave slightly different. So um, you can imagine that uh, the more test results, serious test results from people who maybe um, are courageous and look at the Perl code of the X2Go server and maybe help us fixing things, that would be awesome. Architecture is not so much a problem. It's, we, have, we have a server sponsored by, by Heinz Markus Grazing. He, we have a root server that has a lot of power and it's just a matter of uh, setting up the build scripts for, for other architectures. Um, so I have to ask because, you know, my name and things, um, yeah. do you have FreeBSD support and is there any like future looking at that? Okay. Um, actually <laughs> there is an extra go client on fresh ports. I've just seen yesterday. Um, and the extra go server is not pack. Well, there's about packaging in general. Um, the client part of x go most client parts are in Debian, Ubuntu, Fedora, uh, EPEL, which is enterprise uh, um, extra packages for enterprise Linux, which is Red Hat enterprise Linux. So, so the official distributions cover the client side quite well already, and also there is in Mac ports, there is in Fresh ports uh, an X2Go client version, um, but not the PyHoka, the the Python applet um, I talked about earlier. This is this is only in Debian, Ubuntu, Fedora. EPL, I think. Um, but the server part 
is, and we don't want to hide that aspect of X2Go, the server part has this X2Go agent and this code of X2Go agent is a complete X11 code tree, a very old one. A one that works, but a one that uh, a code tree that that needs to be looked at better, in my opinion, from the security aspect, um, because it's Xorg six point nine. That's was the base when it was forked, and then all this annex stuff was was uh, put on top, and we. At the moment, this this original code from No Machine is not maintained anymore, or not maintained. It's not maintained. Let's call it mm. like that. So what we did is we did a redistribution, and I think that was Christmas 2011 or 2000. No, 2011. I started uh, putting putting all these components together, putting them into a Git, putting a patch system on top of it, and now being able to provide build fixes um, for build failures on 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 modern on newer architectures like AMD, uh, like like ARM 64 at the moment. Um, or uh, adding features, which we do. We add features to uh, features to to an X agent, X to go agent, um, or uh, fixing security problems. So, and this this uh, X to go agent, NX Lips, we call the source project, is only in Fedora at the moment. And I'm not quite sure it might also be an EPL, but the Debian security team has definitely said a no to another X11 code tree. Especially an old one like like the one that NX is based on. So um, so for the server part, we are in the responsibility for those who want to use Exago to provide builds and packages, um, and packages that fit to that fit with Debian testing, Debian Jesse, uh, Debian Debian stable, Ubuntu, the LTS versions, and maybe the the interim versions um, as well. And also for Fedora, and we have a customer that wants OpenSUSE and SUSE Enterprise Linux as well in the near future. Cool. Um, I'm not. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say I'm not much very familiar with desktop Linuxes, so I, I don't. I can't ask a lot of questions in here. But uh, I, I did also notice though that um, you know you talked about that this is a X11 server that was forked, and then all these other things added to it. I think you're very carefully describing, or very uh, at least uh, elaborating on, the, both the blessing and the curse of forking, which is that uh, it allowed people to add more features to the base core server and take it in a direction that wasn't normally heading, wouldn't have been heading. But now you have essentially this code base that's way off in the distance somewhere from from how everything else has gone forward. Um, do you think it would have been better if this was uh, a bunch of libraries on top of the existing server, or would that not have been possible? Um, it would be better, indeed. Um, on last DEPConf in Switzerland, um, I gave a talk about x go and discussed exactly um, this uh, issue around the NX libraries and the integration into Debian or the, the packaging for Debian. And um, as you might know, Keith Packett, the um, upstream maintainer of Xorg, is uh, now also a member of the Debian technical committee and he was on the DebConf. And um, it was a bit funny because in my talk, I, there was this guy in this, uh, I think it was an orange shirt he was wearing and he was giving really competent advice and really giving competent feedback about what I was talking about. And it was so competent that I was, that I said, my God, I have to watch my my my, my video of, of my talk again because I didn't get it live, you know. And mm -hmm. um, and only at the end I realized that this guy talking to me in the audience and giving support, offering support, and you know, if you want to rebase NX, the X or project is really open. And you know, uh, only at the bar at the same the same night I realized, oh my God, this is the guy who is responsible for. Xorg and doing the release management and everything. So and so, what we discussed then was if we get the manpower or the funding and then the manpower um, to rebase the NX technology against what is happening in Xorg, then he will give us the help he can he can give us to to actually integrate NX into current Xorg. But we did some calculations on that, and that would mean someone who really understands the X11 code work on it for three months to up to a year, up to half a year. Uh, and you can imagine full time and you can imagine that um, this cannot be funded out of nothing. And no one, uh, no one sane will give half a year without being paid to such a project. It's just really, it would be really much work. And you're, you're completely right about the forking. It's something that the No Machine Company did that we took over now. 
and and that we have to handle at the moment. It's it's oh. also worth mentioning that the the forking then was 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 an, you know was much more difficult because they cannot have any GPL code in the x.org uh, project, only a permissively licensed code. But now the x.org project changed their rules and the driver code can be GPL, while the core of the X11 server has to remain uh, permissively licensed. So for yeah, that reason, for it's, that. It's, now a, it's, a lot e it's a lot more easier for us to merge in all that GPL driver code now. From, from, the, license as from the license aspect, it, was, it wasn't possible in the past to, to merge these two, to, to get this um, partly GPL license code from No Machine into Xorg. And this, as Michael, Michael said, is, is, has changed... Um, with the uh, seven major seven release of, of Xorg, I think it was when they changed that. And I also just wanted to emphasize: I've been on a couple of cruises with Keith Packard, and I, he he stands out in terms of his uh, abilities and skill and being able to uh, deal with all that. Um, it was um, I remember he was talking about uh, he did a talk on Cairo when it was like brand new, so it was must have been what about eight years ago, seven years ago. But um, yeah, very very interesting guy. Um, so. We, we've established that the, the, the server has to be ported, and this is why it's probably, why you can't possibly have it on, the, on a FreeBSD machine, uh, because it needs to have, it needs to look a lot like the X11 server would be native there. Um, is it possible to run it under, uh, like, Linux emulation? Would that be enough, or do we, does that not get us far enough? Can you, can you say the last question again? Is it... Um, would it be possible to run the existing server under Linux emulation on FreeBSD? Because it's, it's apparently it's a pretty good Linux uh, setup. Um, yes, indeed, you can. Well, like like in a change route, you mean? Yeah. So 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 X uh, X to go uses SSH for authentication. Mm -hmm. So what you what you need is you need an SSH daemon that SSHs you into the change route, and mm -hmm. the users have to exist in the change route, and and then in this change route you can install. Um, I guess so. I've never tried that actually. And as far as I know, the Xorg builds on FreeBSD, the old one, the 6.9. There is there are build rules in in the code, if I remember correctly, in the make files. Um, I've never tried building it on FreeBSD, but you could try. Yes, so sure, I'm sure. I seem to recall, and this may be a dream I had, or this may have been somebody I talked to, um, but I think they were talking about the new version of X11 and like. There's some weirdness with getting that ported over to FreeBSD, so this could be a pretty complex task. I mean, it. Okay. 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 Uh, have to look at it <laughs> and talk to more yeah, people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But either way, if somebody is willing to spend the time trying those things out, we're 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 happy to help them with uh, any technical questions they have. Yeah, cool. and, and we. So so what is um what what um when I joined the project in 2010, there was it was a free software X to go. But it was closed source, so the development took place somewhere, and and, and then a, a certain state of the code was published, and you could use it or you could just you know, um, but the development process was not visible was not visible in in the public, and that was one one goal I had when I joined the project. Then I wanted a, a public Git repository, I wanted a bug tracker, and you know all these kinds of tools that that open source projects have, and and coming. Well, together with that, um, I sort of became the well, the Git manager. So, so managing the code base basically and accepting the patches. And um, so, so if if someone uh, starts working on FreeBSD integration of Xgo, if that's possible or not, I don't know. I can't say at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll be so happy to to apply the patches we got sent. Absolutely cool. So I'm, I'm thinking more about back at being a user of this thing. Um, I, I presume that when I'm getting a remote desktop. Uh, it actually, uh, am I able to hear the sounds that are being generated by the remote machine? You're even able to print uh, documents that you want to print from these remote Exago sessions. And these documents, if the setup is correct, come out of your printer next to your PC. Now, if I've yes, heard sound, of something... Well, and, and sound, sound oh, yes. Sorry, sound, sound, yes, as well. It's just sound is natural. Uh, for a remote desktop session, you need sound. I mean, mm. it's something that well, I sometimes. expect. Sometimes, well, sometimes I mean, when I'm yeah. at work all, time, all the time, I've got my sound turned entirely down, so I don't even know. There, there are some programs that when I finally use them in a quiet environment and I can actually turn my sound back on, um, yeah. they make beeps and stuff, and I go, I didn't know it was doing that. <laughs> 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 I never okay, know. Right. <laughs> yeah, so uh, also, um, now, so if you were running, say, uh, a browser, 
you know, on the on the other on the other machine. Would you be able to play like uh, uh, HD movies and stuff? Can this protocol handle that stream of information? Um, the um, Xgo has challenges like those actually, um, mm. and so so let me just say how this why why Xgo is so performant um, compared to to technologies like RDP or VNC. Mm -hmm. um, and the difference, the difference of what makes the remote desktop performant is if not all the images that you see on the desktop are transferred over the network, but if instructions are transferred that draw these images or draw these windows and boxes and buttons, you know. So, and that's what X11 does and that's what is used in, in, in X2Go as well. So the more 2D-like a desktop is, the more rendering ca that can take place on the client the better is the performance of the X2Go session. Now you can imagine uh, having large images. Well, you have to transfer the bitmap for that image. Having moved images like a movie, then you need to transfer each image of that movie or, or at least the part of the uh, movie that changes. And, um, and X2Go is not a streaming protocol. X2Go is, a, is, is X11 underneath. So what and what what we are working on at the moment, uh, actually not me, but a guy from China who lives near Hong Kong, uh, is Norwegian actually. Um, um, he is working um, uh, on a multimedia solution for X2Go so that we don't have, we won't have HTML videos, HTML5 videos, but we will have every uh, media file that you can imagine is, well, all, even uh, 4K, um, this new 4K video files that get played on the server um, with a special media player and then this file is by some magic transferred to the client as, as a stream and um, and on on the client there's the actual player window popping up and we have so on the server you have a GUI which we call mteleplayer and over a framework called telekinesis we transfer all the metadata around this video where is the video on the screen uh, is it getting resized at the moment is it full screen is it is it in a video player window um, and um, and we we transfer also the 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 GUI buttons like play and pause and rewind and slider information um, through the telekinesis framework to the client and there is an M player window without any decorations around that exactly at the right position appears um, and the look and feel of it is um, as if you play the video on the server session and it just you know it shows on your client and it. It, it, the, the, the quality is so so good from wow. what I've seen so far. And the next step will be um, implementing that, that technology for, for web browsers. So as a plug-in container for a web browser. It's, it's also so, worth noting that until telekinesis is developed, you can still play videos right now over X2Go. They'll just be slower and you know, it works much better over a, a LAN, a fast connection. But at least the yeah. videos are compatible. YouTube, for example, a small, uh, a standard size YouTube video works fairly well. What about stuff like OpenGL support? Say that again. Uh, what about stuff like OpenGL support? Okay, this is um, there comes again this old version of the X server we're using for X to go. We have um, well, we have GLX. Um, the extension is as version six, and many current libraries like libcairo or other rendering libraries, they require nowadays, require version 8 of the extension. Um, and, um, and any kind of 3D will be Mesa. So it will be uh, simulated, emulated, and it w won't be hardware accelerated. Okay, so um, is there any work to try to I'm sorry if, I, if somebody already answered this, but is there any work to try to like catch those versions up so there would be less of an issue with it? Um, w as, I, as I said earlier, we have to think about the, um, the, the, the future of the NX. So either we have to um, upgrade the different extensions in the NX tree, or we have to rebase the code against the, the X11, um, uh, current X11 version. And both tasks are, are not easy to do. So, so it's, um, this is, we are discussing it still and work on it hasn't started yet. So getting, getting off uh, onto a different topic here, one of the big concerns I've always had is authentication. So VNC kind of, you know, issues, they don't really have good ways to handle that. So how is X2Go handling authentication? 
I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so um, X to go is SSH, basically. So the um, the two clients available, um, which is Pahoka or Python X to go, um, as which is the library name underneath, um, or the X to go client, um, they use different SSH client implementations. So um, the X to go client uses libssh and authenticates against the normal open SSH server on the remote machine. And the Python x to go client um, uses Paramico, um, Python Paramico, which is which is a implementation an implementation of the SSH protocol written in completely written in Python. Um, so, and everything that you can do with SSH is thinkable, thinkable uh, with x to go. Not always possible because it has to be implemented into the GUI functionality of the one or the other client. I can give some examples. Um, the Python next to go can do, of course, username and password authentication. It can do um, public private key authentication. It can use a running a locally running SSH agent. It can forward SSH uh, agent requests from or well, after the uh, session has started from the server back to the client, so that you can build up an SSH agent chain of, of authentication tunnels, so to say. Um, the x to go client uh, can store, it, it can use smart cards and on these uh, GPG smart cards and on these GPG smart cards, the private SSH keys of those of the users logging into x to go sessions are stored. So so you can use this, these cards for, for triggering the um, SSH based authentication. Then currently we added, or, or another developer added, Google Authenticator support. So this one-time one-time password thing, and um, and we have Keros, so GSS API support as well in X to Go client, about, but not. Yeah. Yeah, you talked about all the ways to make SSH more secure, but I also I, I, I believe I'm I'm aware of this. Well, how, how would I know if I'm aware of this? <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't mean English is not my second language, apparently. Okay, so the, um, I know I, I've seen at least, I, I, or I remember reading something about being able to run SSH using uh, no encryption. So just using it for the connection protocol. And then, the, the, of course, this would only be useful in an area where, you know, the wire itself was protected. Uh, you wouldn't want to use it in any place where everybody can spy the, the, the thing to go across. Have you ever played with that, uh, played with X2Go using a, a really thin SSH? Um, no, it's actually the first time I hear of it, actually. Um, and it's nothing we want. We want to, uh, I mean, you, you know, maybe in old RDP implementations like RDP version 5 or so, you had this, normally things are encrypted, but if the line is not well enough, then okay, let's forget about the encryption and the user is not really informed about that. Um, mm. so, so we want encryption and we want the users to have to, well, to be sure, if I use X2Go, I'm in, everything is going inside an SSH connection. Um, and we, you can play with, um, with the SSH algorithms, which improves speed here and there. So um, we, we used to um, use the Blowfish algorithm, which is pretty weak um, and used to be performant, but there are some um, modern chips I just learned today from the guy who's doing the, the uh, telekinesis and teleplayer thing. Um, th they can handle the AES algorithm, which is um, actually needs much more resources to, 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 to uh, decipher and cipher, but uh, the, the chipsets um, are somewhat specialized for those. Um, I haven't tested that, but I will play with it, definitely. So, cool. so you can tweak SSH. It's also worth noting that, you know, lots of companies will have, like, requirements. You must use this encryption with SSH, and that can be set on the server. You just configure the open SSH uh, server however you, you have to do, and then the x go client or PyHoka GUI will, will auto-detect or auto-negotiate which encryption method to use based on what the server permits. Are you accounting entirely on SSH's compression, or is there also some things in the uh, protocol that are uh, trying to maximize the bandwidth? Um, oh, for for X11 traffic, the NX libraries, the NX framework, that does compression and caching, and that's and and that's you know does a very good job. Uh, for audio, it's currently uncompressed because we use uh, Pulse Audio or Enlightenment Sound Daemon. Mm -hmm. uh, but and you can actually have the option of having 
the, the audio go outside of the SSH tunnel, but everything else always goes in the SSH tunnel, and we use NX for the encryption or for the compression. Very good, very good. Uh, I've got to ask some uh, other sort of standard questions about most open source projects. So, what licenses is this all under? Um, the so so if we are free to choose a license, um, then it's GPL, and um, for some newer projects, it's AGPL. So mm -hmm. because um, X2Go can become something that is inside a web page, it can. There's a plugin for for Firefox that uh, can start X2Go sessions inside of Firefox, and we're all thinking about looking at newer technolo another technology instead of NX, which is called Gate1, one, Gate1X11, one which will be uh, an X11 session written completely into the canvas of the, of the browser. Um, so, and, and with, those, with those setups or with those scenarios, it's quite good to have the Afero um, GNU public license, general mm -hmm. public license. Um, sometimes, uh, no, actually, I'm just thinking about, we have, we, we adopted some code here and there, and then it might be LGPL. Um, but we we tend we want everything be uh, be be GPL at least. And uh, you said you mentioned a couple times earlier that the German government was funding some of this. How are are there paid developers as well as voluntary developers, or, or um, are you all just working on your own time? So um, currently, there are two two companies, or well, two freelancers to be to be honest, who mm. who earn part of their living from Mexico, which is me and Alexander Schneider. Um, Alexander is the, the actual developer, the, or is one of the founders of the project, and he's the actual developer of, um, of X2Go clients. So, so if there are bigger code changes, then it's him. And he mostly does it on contracts, actually. So he has certain companies around Germany and, uh, and also from abroad um, that, that request certain features or, or want this bug really fixed because it really you know, it really annoys them. And um, so then, then he works on that. He is also the person who would do the rebasing of the um, uh, NX X11 code. Um, and um, so that's the two of us. And then there are a couple of people we know from IRC, from email, who are administrators at larger companies that deploy X2Go inside the company and that well, they, they, they are the administrators there. So they, they administrate X to go and get paid for that. But, but it's not that they, they join in the development by contributing e, either bug reports or, or maybe or even patches. So, yeah. Um, but this, this whole concept of funding is something we really could improve and want to improve. But it's, I mean, it's a matter of the market, you know. So, um, so your contributors are mostly the core team. Uh, do you ever get do you get patches and stuff from outside that? Yeah, a lot. We get since since last well for for a year now I think or for one and a half year more and more people have joined the project, joined our IRC channel, stay there as as residents or stay or just come and go, and. Um, and there are also people who use X to go in a business model. For example, there's one pro called a glove box, which really protects a medical office from the outside world. But still, you have browser and email inside, inside a router that runs X to go. Um, and, but the Windows machines behind that are separated completely. Um, so, um, and, and more and more people have been play, have started playing with X2Go in the last year or the last one and a half year. And actually, we get quite a lot of patches, especially since one component of X2Go has been released the first time, which is called the X2Go Session Broker, which is a, uh, it's, it's, it's a system that X2Go clients can connect to first. And from the broker, they get the available sessions on different X2Go servers in your company network or wherever. Um, and from there you connect, then you connect to, um, to the X2Go servers and start the sessions there. Well, then, um, uh, and this, give, and the release yeah. of the X2Go session broker changed the, the patch and the bug reporting situation tremendously because loads of people were waiting, seemingly were waiting for, for such an extra feature, extra add-on, extra product for X2Go. So given that uh, you have some core people that are being paid and some core people that are working as volunteers, 
and a lot of contributions from outside, or at least some amount of contributions from the outside. What decides governance then? How do you decide on a roadmap? Is that only the core people that decide on the roadmap, or is there influence from the outside? Is there influence from the paid components? Um, so, um, the the so what we what we what we have as focus is compatibil uh, compatibility. Uh, so newer servers and old clients should work together well and also vice versa. And so that's something that, that we provide as a policy. And then um, the, the feature development is, um, has two impacts uh, or has two, two influences. One is companies um, contacting me or Alex and saying, hey, what about this? What about that? Uh, could you add that? And then we say, mm, okay, well, within this basic concept of, you know, we want to have legacy support for old version. We want to make people have a smooth upgrade path for, for X to go components. Um, inside this concept, yeah, we could add that, add that feature. And then we add that feature and, um, and then X to go changes um, step by step. Um, and, um, and mostly it is, um, I, so, so the roadmap is often dictated by what people want to work on. So, and that has changed uh, in the last three or four years because it was, at that time, it was a core team that was deciding, okay, we want this feature and that feature and our municipality wants this and that and we do that and then period, that's it. And now it, is, it has become into a person popping up on the developer mailing list and saying, hey, I have this and that use case. And mm -hmm. from my employer, I get a weak time. Uh, what would be the best approach to, to add this feature or to fix this bug or whatever? And, um, and then we say, yes, okay, what, what do you need? What information do you want? Uh, we can work together on that, stuff like that. And that, that's happening. A big deal of that is happening in my part-time, especially, yes. It's Good also deal. worth mentioning... Sorry, it's also mentioning that we follow the standard like Git and Linux kernel mailing list practices for uh, reviewing patches. Somebody submits a patch to the mailing list and, and we discuss it and then we merge it. Okay, cool. Uh, we're almost out of time. I just wanted to ask Mike one first. Uh, is there anything that we really want to make sure we cover? And keep in mind, we're almost out of time. Um, I think technically we have covered a lot. I, in the last you know, five minutes, I mentioned the Xigo Session Broker, which mm -hmm. will become a more and more important component for the enterprise usage of Xigo. So mm -hmm. um, um, companies seeing us here, um, take a look at the Xigo Session Broker, meet us on our mailing list, meet us on RSC and get in contact. What our intention for this interview is basically spread, 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 spread Xigo, make it known, uh, let people try it and, um, and get more people in at the end, get more people into the development. And that, yeah, that would be something, if, if that can happen by this interview, that would be really awesome. And well, we welcome everyone. Quite a few people listening to this podcast. I'm sure you'll, uh, excuse me, netcast. Sorry, Leo. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> it killed me if I mentioned the P word here. That's horrible. Anyway, um, uh, two final questions I have to ask Mike. One first, then we'll go over to Mike too. Uh, what's your favorite scripting language? Um, the Well, Python X to go, I've written in Python. So mm -hmm. I do a lot in Python. And uh, the rest of X to go server has been written in Perl and I'm getting a hang of it. So I'm really starting to like that as well. Um, and as a system administrator, I'm bashing around parts of my day. Absolutely. Hey, if you uh, need some help on Perl, I can recommend a couple of good books, tutorials. <laughs> yes, I've read about those. <laughs> do, you recommend, do you recommend a few camels? Uh, the, the llama and the alpaca books, uh, basically the two tutorial books, are actually selling more than the camel, which is really nice for me because I get <laughs> credit for those. Um, and the other question is uh, favorite text editor. Back to Mike one. Oh, um, I use MC, Midnight Commander, and MC Edit for everything. Cool, cool. And Mike too, anything else that we left out that you also want to make sure we get covered? I mean, uh, yeah, I'd just like to point out, you know, there's uh, – I'd like to point out that you know, there's lots of desktop environments and we're, we're eager to fix any compatibility issues. Um, the only two desktop environments we do have any compatibility with these is currently are GNOME 3 and Unity. Um, and in Unity, it's, it's fine on 12.04. But, but any, of those, any of those patches to make, you know, make your favorite desktop environment work well with XGO, we're happy to, we're happy to include those patches. 
Cool, cool. I, I don't understand what any of that means, so uh, I will just hope that our audience does. <laughs> like I said, I'm not a Linux guy, so I'm not a Linux desktop guy, so I have no idea what this is all about. But uh, and, and Mike, too, the same two questions. So first, your favorite scripting language? The, the scripting language I know best is, best is definitely Bash. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, you got to learn Python. I've heard Ruby is really good, too. Mm -hmm. And my favorite text editor is Vim. Um, I also use Pluma, the Mate desktop uh, text editor, a little bit, too. Great, great. Well, it, uh, like I said, we're out of time, but uh, I want to thank the two Mikes, Mike uh, uh, Gabriel and Mike DiPaolo, for coming on the show and talking about X2Go. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Awesome, awesome. So that was X2Go. Randy, what do you think? That's pretty cool. I mean, I like the idea. I'm starting to think that I might be able to use this at work or even myself. So I'm always excited when I can find new projects to play with. Yeah, and I, I like that it's also it was a lot more than VNC, you know, because VNC was uh, sort of uh, minimal, but it sounds like it's really useful if you want to uh, have terminal servers and, and uh, you know, if they get a little bit more portability in and if they can rebase it back on the uh, current uh, X base, X org base, that would be really nice because they can like, add a bunch of new features and maybe update some of their, uh, like the, I think you asked about OpenGL. And of course, you can't get there without the with the current code base. So that's uh, that's interesting. So um, anything else you want to add before we start talking about next week's guest? Um, let's see. So you usually ask me what I do, and I wanted to mention that I went to ChefConf, and it was amazing. It is one of the best conferences I have been to. So highly recommend it to anybody who's into configuration management or you know the DevOps side of things. So there's Very my cool, little. Yeah. <laughs> ChefConf, yes, ChefConf, where you chef your conf, yes, exactly. <laughs> they, they aren't going to use that, don't worry. <laughs> That's just stupid. <laughs> All right, so coming up next week, uh, we have uh, the Bro Security Network Security Monitor. So apparently your big bro comes out and takes care of your network for you. Um, we have BuddyCloud after that, which is chat and file sharing and social activity infrastructure that you can add your website. For example, if you have a website about cats, maybe the people that can all chat with each other about cats would be interesting, I guess. Uh, Tonika, which is a platform for social networks. So I guess you can build the platform with Tonika and then have BuddyCloud be able to do the chatting behind the scenes. That would be kind of fun. Uh, just added to the schedule. I can't give you all the details yet because we're still working on them, but uh, that fourth episode's coming up because, in fact, episode number 300, can you believe it? 300 for Floss Weekly. And uh, I'm going to be on. I'm going to have some very special co-hosts on, still to be decided. We don't know what the format's going to be yet. We're still working all that out. But uh, it'll basically be sort of a, a recap, I guess. Or I don't know. I, we haven't figured out what we're going to do. But it's going to be episode 300 coming up very special soon, too. Uh, that means the Q2 is all full. So I'll be opening up the Q3 soon and sending out more emails. And you'll be hearing about new people we're going to be adding to the schedule. You can always find out more about that by going to our homepage, which is twit.tv slash floss. And linked from there is the big, giant Google spreadsheet that I keep track of all the upcoming guests on. And the schedule is always there. You can follow us at Floss Weekly on Google+. Plus. I try to announce uh, new guests as they get added or special events, or I try to also give out a one-hour announcement ahead of time about what's, who's actually going to be coming on. Uh, you know, that also automatically tweets over to Floss Weekly, all one word. So you can also follow us on Twitter if that's how you prefer to do that. We do have a live chat room. We took a number of questions from the live chat room today. Uh, that's at live.twit.tv at 8.30 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays, which is when we tape this show, uh, unless it's a specially moved time. Uh, you can follow me at Merlin, M-E-R-L-Y-N, on Twitter. Uh, and probably about 27 other social services. I'm either Merlin or real Merlin, because if I can't get Merlin, I go, damn it, I'm the real Merlin. Oops, I said a bad word. Bleep. Anyway, um, bleep is a little bit late there, of course. Uh, and uh, But I'm more posting these days to Google+, and that's at Randall L. Schwartz. Uh, speaking of posting special events, three weeks from today, uh, on uh, June 11th, which is actually also a Floss Weekly taping day, I won't be the host on Floss Weekly because I'll have flown to London, and I'm going to have a special meetup. Uh, I at least have some of the Pearl guys stopping by, so that'll be fun. I'm trying to find some other communities to invite, but I'm also inviting y'all. If you're in the London area on June 11th, starting probably 5 or 6 p.m., kind of, you know, as people get off work or whatever, they can just drop by. I'll be in the uh, Kensington Gardens area. There's a pub there called Goat. G-O-A-T, and I'm sure you can Google for it. It's real close to one of the tube stops. It's pretty easy to get to. And Kensington Gardens apparently are fairly centralized, so uh, not too hard for everybody to get to. So uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to meeting some of you live. And uh, although not confirmed, uh, we may have one of our people you've seen on this show also at that meetup event, so that'll be fun too. Anyway, uh, plans are still being made, as we always say. Um, I think that's all I'm plugging right now. And you already plugged the, the comp. Do you want to plug anything else? Oh, no, that's about it. Sorry, jumped the gun a little bit on that one. <laughs> that's okay. And uh, how do people follow you if they want to find out more oh, about you? Um, I am FreeBSD Girl on Twitter. Pretty much FreeBSD Girl everywhere. I'm on all the things. So, yeah, um, yeah. luckily nobody else takes that name. They know it's mine. 
That is amazing. I, I, whenever a new social service gets announced, I immediately try to jump on Merlin on that so I can get that. But uh, like I said, half the time it's already taken or something. So I, I, when, I, when I signed up for AOL the first time, I tried to get Merlin and it wouldn't, didn't work. So I said, darn it, I'm the real Merlin of that. So it, it's really strange, but it sort of has a double meaning now. I'm really the wizard, you know, which is kind of cool too. So it uh, works out really nice for everything. So anyway, I think that's it. I think we're out of time. We're actually probably past out of time. So we'll see you all again next week on Gloss Weekly. 